so thank you very much uh, for uh, this invitation to all the organizers. I can imagine that organizing this conference in this uh, COVID chaos it was not easy. So thank you very much for, for all the work. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about these motives of singularity categories. And uh, well, uh, oh, sorry, I have a, a Discord. Wait, I, I'm sorry, I lost my. How can I see again my share screen? Sorry, uh, there's something happened here. Uh, oh. I don't see my screen. Uh, oh, what's wrong? But at the moment, it's, uh, it's shared. Can uh, you, you can alt tab? It? Yeah, yeah. Alt tab. Uh, Try hitting uh, the Zoom thing again on your yeah. laptop. Yeah. Come up. Well, it doesn't share. Yeah, I don't see the screen. So uh, the, the, the screen is sharing now. It's sharing. So you just have to 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 make the, the the correct window appear again, or you can stop the the, the sharing and start it again, maybe. Maybe it's going to be easier. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry for this. I don't know what is going on. So let me go again on this. Uh, yes, you can see now. OK. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't touch this again. So uh, yes. So. As I was saying, thank you for organizing this, this school. So I, I will be talking about this uh, story of uh, motives of uh, singularity categories. So I will need a bit of preparation to talk about this. So let's uh, say more or less the contents of the talk. So first, if you have any questions, please stop me. Uh, Second, uh, the, mo the results of this talk were obtained together with uh, uh, Anthony Blanc, Bertrand Thauvin, and Gabriele Bizzozzi um, some time ago. And more recently, there are uh, some progresses in this, in this topic. And I want to briefly, by at the end, to mention two uh, uh, progresses uh, uh, concerning this topic. So the first one is concerning the PhD thesis of Massimo Pippi, who just defended. Uh, and another uh, is this project, this program uh, of Toen Vizosi about the block conductor formula. So I will very, very briefly mention these two uh, applications of the, the story I'll try to tell. Okay, so here's the plan for the talk. So the first part of the talk, I will spend some time explaining the story of singularity categories and um, the relation to market factorizations. Um, I will tell a bit of where these things come from, and uh, I'll tell the motivation for what we're gonna do next. So in the second part of the talk, I will make a bit of a digression and talk about uh, motives of singularity categories, but more general, so generally motives of digit categories. So this comes uh, in the continuation of uh, Gonzalo's Taboada uh, previous lecture. So there is an overlap between the two talks. I'll try to explain this. Uh, then I will try to explain you the, 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 the connection between these singularity categories and its vanishing cycles. So that's the main theorem of this talk. And as I said, in the end, if I have some time, I, I just want to brief, uh, briefly uh, survey some these results and new uh, progresses. Okay, so let's start with this uh, review of the singularity categories and matrix factorizations. Okay, so let's start with the, how this one way to enter this story is to start with this um, theorem of Serre that uh, allows us to understand, uh, to detect the singularities of a scheme uh, just by looking at its uh, derived category. So essentially what this theorem of Serre says is that a scheme uh, is regular if and only if uh, perfect complexes, the drive category of perfect complexes and the drive category of coherent uh, bounded coherent sheaves agree. So I, I, I want to say more concretely what this means. So this means the following thing. So let's first uh, make a remark. The first remark is that there is always an inclusion going in this way, meaning perfect complexes inside the drive categories of bounded coherent sheaves. 
or it's not exactly always. Uh, well, you need some hypothesis on X, um, eventually called connective, but in the cases of this talk, it's always. Then the complicated part is uh, the other inclusion, and this is not true in, in all generality. So the, the key lemma that we have to look at is this lemma of Ser that allows us to, it gives us a criterion to, to test uh, if a scheme is regular by looking at the shape of resolutions of coherent modules. So the, the first theorem is this one. It says that a scheme is regular if and only if any um, module, uh, coherent uh, sheaf on M, uh, let's say in the heart of the derived category, admits a finite resolution by vector bundles, which is finite. So in meaning I start resolving my module by projective models, and at some point this stops, and this stops at the dimension. So, uh, and this is exactly what allows me to say that the derived category of this derived category, all objects here actually have a resolution that live in here. So the two categories agree. So this is the starting point for this story. And, but we are not interested in this case, we are interested in something a bit more um, uh, general. So we, we want to understand what happens when X is not regular. So in this case, we want to understand the excess of this inclusion. So this is always living inside, so perfect complexes live inside the derived category of cohesion shifts. So we are interested in understanding this excess because the theorem of Serre tells us exactly that this excess vanishes if and only if the scheme is regular. So most of the time in this talk, I will be working with the scheme over, over, over C, over a field, so I will use regular and smooth uh, uh, to say the same thing. So, um, so the first uh, thing we can try to, to do, and this is a definition due to Orlov, is to isolate this excess. So this excess uh, called the singularity category is exactly the quotient of the, the coherent sheaves on X by the perfect complexes on X. So the only thing that remains after this quotient are exactly the things that, obs that give uh, obstruction to smoothness. So we take the Verdi quotient because here, everywhere here, I mean DG categories, okay? For, throughout the talk, I mean DG categories. Or actually, in this case, in this particular case, you can actually mean the triangulated category. So the first thing we want to uh, understand in this talk is how to control this excess, this, this piece of information. So Eisenbud, uh, gave us a formula to control this, this uh, excess in a very particular case. And this particular case is the following. We suppose that our uh, uh, X, our scheme, is actually given by the zero log of some function on an ambient space U. So I have X uh, is just the zeros of some polynomial function on some U, and U is smooth. And then in this particular setting, I can say something about the singularities of X. So what can I say? Well, I can say the following thing. So let's look at this formula. I'm sorry, I wrote it already, but let's try to isolate piece by piece what, it, what I'm saying here. So let's take again here a coherent module on X. So X is my upper surface. It's the zeros of this polynomial. Let's take M. So if, Serre, if X was smooth, then all I would have would be this piece of information, a finite resolution by vector bundles, only this. And this actually leaves, is a perfect complex. So the theorem of Eisenberg tells us that, well, in the case of an hypersurface with singularities, what's going to happen is the following. The resolution does not stop. It continues all the way to infinity, but there is a strange phenomenon happening is that is the fact that after the dimension, uh, this resolution becomes periodic, too periodic. So the term here is a term here, and the term here is term there. So although it is infinite, we can control it by uh, this two, period, two periodicity. So how do you prove this? Well, if you go for the computations, it amounts to just using the Auslander books amount uh, formula in commutative algebra. But uh, this is the idea, okay? So essentially, if I, in the case of an hypersurface, any M coherent on X, I can uh, resolve it 
uh, by two kinds of data. One is this finite resolution by vector bundles, and another one is this infinite length but two periodic resolution. So let's try to axiomatize a bit the situation here. And this is exactly what Eisenberg did. It introduced a, a category, which he called a category of matrix factorizations. So U is our ambient scheme, F is our function, X is our hypersurface inside U. So we define the category of such strange objects consisting of a pair of vector bundles, Q and P, two maps of vector bundles, okay, vector bundles on U. This is a point of attention. So a pair of vector bundles on U, two maps of vector bundles, such that when I compose them independently of the direction, the map I get is the multiplication by F. So you see that uh, in particular, this is something that is uh, lives over U, but if I go to, the, to X, meaning I kill F, when I kill F, this thing here becomes a two periodic complex because multiplication by F just by definition is, is killed. So it just gets zero. So in a way, these objects of this category become presentations for such kind of complexes, infinite uh, but two periodic complexes. So uh, the starting point of this uh, construction I will mention today is this following theorem of Warlow that says the following. Well, perfect complexes can only be seen inside the derived category of Cuhin sheaves. This is always for the purpose of this talk. And then there is this excess, meaning the quotient of this by this. And the theorem of Rolovov says that I can identify this quotient exactly with this category I just described, matrix factorizations. And how does the procedure goes? Uh, heuristically, it goes exactly like this. If I have a, a, a module M, the finite piece of resolution by vector bundles lives in this part. And at the other, at the, on, from the other side here, I only get the two periodic piece of information. So in a way, I have an exact sequence of categories where I store uh, these two kinds of information on, on the extremities. Um, so this is the starting point of this talk. Of course, by the theorem of Serre uh, that I mentioned before, uh, if uh, this excess piece of information vanishes, then X is smooth, and this is an if and only. So this category controls all the singularities of uh, the hypersurface. So this is the, 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 the starting point of, the, of, of this talk. And now I want to br briefly uh, mention two computations one can do just to get uh, a feeling of what is matrix factorization and the kind, of the kind of information that we can have stored in these categories. So the first one is, uh, is called as neural periodicity. So, so uh, yes. So, excuse me, Mark, there's a question. Is, so uh, is there something similar for regular embeddings of higher co-dimensions? I will come back to this by the end of the talk. So this is exactly what I said. Uh, is, uh, so this is the concerns, the, the, the progresses in the thesis of uh, Massimo Pippi. So I'll come back to that at the end. Okay. Any more questions? No. Okay. Oh, no. So uh, let me just, as an example, brief uh, mention two different uh, computations one can do that can give us an idea of what these things uh, are. So the first example, this one, uh, is the computation of uh, matrix factorizations where the ambient scheme is just uh, the A2 and the function is X squared plus Y squared. I'm working over C here. Okay. Sorry, there, there is another question just to yes. add. Does the, does the category of matrix factorization have a structure of a triangulated category in a natural yes. way? Yes, in a natural way. Yes, yes, yes. In a way, if you want, either you see it through this equivalence, this is a Verdi equation and the Verdi equation of two triangulated categories as a canonical structure of, uh, of a triangulated category. And this equivalence is compatible with this. Get equivalence. So uh, yeah, so back to this comp first computation, we can show that uh, if I take the ambient space A2 with this function, then I have an equivalence of two periodic DG categories. So this is something I didn't mention here, but 
As you can guess already by the structure I put here, this is two periodic uh, resolutions, this category is going to be two periodic. I didn't say anything about these two periodic. It is not obvious that this category here also has a two periodic structure, okay? Uh, at least from the description I gave here. But in fact, it is true, it has a two periodic structure and these two things are compatible. But it takes a bit more time to find out the two periodic structure on this uh, category. So I was saying, first of all, uh, we can try to compute this simple example and what we get is called nor periodicity that says that MF on A2 with this function X squared plus Y squared is just MF on the point with a function zero. And if you see what MF on the point with a function zero means, well, we just get exactly two periodic complexes. So complexes with maps going in, in different uh, directions whose composition gives zero. So this is an exercise uh, we can do. And as another uh, feature of, of this, this category is, is this Tom Sebastiani um, property that says that MF of a product a1, A2 is just a product of A1 and A1, is actually the tensor product of MFs of each copy of A1 with the corresponding functions. So this is called the Tom Sebastiani theorem. Uh, and the generality that I'm gonna use here, it has been proved by, by Pregel for matrix factorizations and Pregel's uh, thesis. So just two examples to give you an idea of what this kind of information these things contain, although it doesn't say much for now. Okay, so now I introduce you these categories of matrix factorizations. Now you know that they somehow encode the existence of singularities. So I want to give you an idea of where we are going. And to start to give you an idea where we are going, I have to, to, to mention you this uh, first result. Um, uh, by Tobias Dikerov and at the same time by Anatoly Pregel that says the following thing. Let's suppose I take a regular local ring R with an element F, okay, a non-zero divisor. Uh, then I can define this category MF. So this category MF is supposed, uh, I expect it to give the singularities of the zero locals of F, meaning uh, spec uh, if I write it here carefully, I want to expect the singularities of spec R mod F. These are exactly the zero locals. So this sits inside spec R. And the, the result of Dikerov is, uh, so in, in this case, there are two results I will mention. So the first result is that uh, this category here, we can show it has a compact generator, an explicit one. We can get a very good control of this compact generator, uh, meaning every object is generated by uh, under uh, shifts and colimits by, by this object. And the second thing you can know, once you compute explicitly this compact generator, is to compute the actual homology of this category, because it becomes just the actual homology of the endomorphism algebra of this compact generator. And the computation of Dikerov shows that the, the actual homology of this category is Jacobian ring. So maybe I should write here Jacobian ring. Where you quotient the ring by the derivatives of it, by the Jacobian of it. Like this way. And so this is, uh, but the degree of this is in the, lives in the degree the dimension of R. So this is an important point. Okay. So uh, if you want, this is the first. Uh, uh, sign that the story uh, of, of, of how we are taking this story is the first uh, hint. And the second hint that explains, uh, yes? There's a question, yeah. Do you assume R is essen essentially a finite type over a field? Uh, I don't think so. I don't remember. I have, I would have to look at it. I don't think so. There's also a qu another question. Uh, H, H H star is graded, and yes. the Jacobian ring is is in general not graded. No, I, I'm saying that it's concentrated in degree d the dimension. So this is non-graded. I'm saying yeah. that the only piece is going to be this. 
this is the greatest part of this in dimension D. Okay. So the question about uh, essentially finite type is, uh, is because the, um, uh, there's a, how do you define the partial der derivatives? Yeah. Ah, uh, um, probably you need some condition of finite type. I, I don't have it in mind. I would have to look it up, but probably you're right. Probably you're right. If it poses a problem for the derivatives, then, then you probably need it. And there's another question. So what happens to the degree if you apply the product structure of R? Not sure. The product structure of R. I'm not sure I understand the question. Same. Okay, let's see. I, I think I think the, the, the what this means is gonna become more uh, easy to understand in the next slide, I hope. So the way to go to understand this, uh, it's, a, it's a, a sequence of results and computations that are all right this way, um, that compute the periodic cyclic homology of this category, okay? So we already saw in the previous talk, uh, uh, this periodic cyclic homology appearing. So there is a computation due to several people uh, that connects this periodic cyclic homology of matrix factorizations to uh, a homology of vanishing cycles. And this is going to be the starting point for this talk. I will come back in a few, in a few uh, minutes to explain uh, the vanishing cycles part of the story. I just want to use this result as a motivation for what we're going to do. I hope that what we're going to do makes this picture also a bit clearer. So if you have questions, I suggest you ask in the end, and then maybe the, what I'm gonna say next can answer your question. So uh, the first part of this result identifies the periodic cyclic homology uh, with the twisted Durham homology, meaning I take the Durham complex, but I twist the differential by this wedge with the, the, the differential of F. So this computation was, is due to Efimov and to Dikerov. And then there is a second half of this computation that uh, due to Sabah and Konsevich that identifies this twisted Durham homology precisely with the homology of vanishing cycles. So what we're gonna try to, what we're gonna do in this talk is to explain you why these two things, this one and this one agree, uh, but we will explain you from the motivic point of view. So here's the, the program for the talk. So here's the idea. We're gonna to try to conceive an object which you're gonna call the motif of the category MF. We're gonna look at the theory of vanishing cycles from a motivic point of view, and we'll try to establish a comparison between the two. So uh, uh, this motivic uh, vanishing cycle side of the story, this was developed in Joseph Ayub's thesis. Uh, and this one, I will explain in a second what this means. But uh, the whole idea, uh, as well I will explain, is to go explain how to go from this side to this side, and we will avoid this. Okay, we want to establish a direct comparison. Yes. There so question. there's a question. HP is taken over Laurent power series here. It's taken over Laurent power series with a variable in degree uh, two. There is a two periodic phenomenon that we have to take in consideration here. This is a very nice, so this form of writing is a very naive, uh, it's a very informal, let's say. There are some subtleties in how I take this HP, and I was trying to put them under the carpet for the purpose of the talk, especially because I'm gonna concentrate on this part, and this part I hope is gonna be clear. So this is what I said, let's, let's hope this will clarify something. Okay, and there's a further question by, yes. Ber by Berkan Uze. Uh, is there a six functor formalism in the non commutative setting? A six functor formalism in a non commutative setting? You mean for non commutative motives? Yeah, I guess. Uh, well, uh, the, the answer is uh, I don't know. Uh, and I don't know means that I thought for a long time about that and I could not uh, prove it. So I tried to do it a long time ago. I could not uh, prove this six functor formalism. Um, yeah. So the okay. answer is, I think it's, uh, I don't know. Maybe someone has thought more about that. Okay. 
Uh, there is a four functor formalism for sure. Okay, the question is the shrieks. Uh, so, okay, so let's let's try to explain what this uh, what this means. So I will start from this side, try to explain you what is the motive of uh, the category of singularities of or FMF, and um, and this is where there will be some overlap with the, what uh, Gonzalo Tawada explained in the previous lecture. So this is first part, I'm gonna give you a, a general uh, digression on non-commutative motives, but I'll try to go very quickly. So this story of non-commutative motives started with some ideas on Konsevich, a suggestion came from Konsevich. And later on, uh, Gonzalo developed a formalism with, uh, and later with uh, Gonzalo and Tawada and Sisinski, they develop a formalism uh, for these non-commutative motives. Um, but this formalism is mostly uh, cohomological. Actually, Gonzalo in this lecture, he, he kind of uh, explained this cohomological because to, in order to relate it to the stable monotopy theory of schemes, he had to use a duality. So in this talk, we're gonna take a, a more homological approach. And, 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 and by this, um, I mean that something closer in the spirit to the original construction of Morel Vavodsky and the motivic homotopy theory. So here's, um, Here's the idea of what we'll try to do. So the, the, the motivic homotopy theory of Morel Vyvodsky, it's, um, it's a construction that takes a smooth scheme and uh, assigns an object in this category we call SH. Well, this SH is a very formal construction. And, and actually, I will try to explore a bit what is the universal property of this construction. And what we'll try to do is to mimic exactly the same steps of this construction, but starting from DG categories instead of starting from smooth schemes. So the first thing, I'm, the first subtlety I'm gonna do here is I will define non-commutative spaces, not at DG categories, but at DG categories with a knob. And the only reason I'm gonna do this is to, to have the same from reality. And then I will introduce this construction, like a non-commutative version of the moral Vyvodsky construction and no dualization is going to be needed to compare these two, these two things. So how are we going to get this? Well, the first step is just to tell you how this is constructed uh, through an universal property. So what is the universal property of this moral Vyvodsky construction? So um, I'm going to write here the following uh, theorem. The following theorem is just, uh, I mean, this is, is more like a, it's a characterization of the, of functor, functors out of, uh, of this category. And it says the following, it says that every time you have a symmetric monodal functor going from smooth schemes to any category that is stable and presentable, and such that uh, F uh, sends these Navage coverings to push, push out squares, F is A1 invariant, meaning precisely what is written here, and such that F sends the the motive of P1 pointed at infinity to some tensor invertible object, uh, then uh, there is a factorization. So I forgot to write this. Uh, so I wrote the theorem in such a way that uh, this functor is the initial functor that verifies all these lists of properties. So any other functor, SM to some D F, sorry to some D that verifies the same list of properties, it factors canonically through SH. You have a question, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, first, uh, so, so I, I, have, uh, I think you, you mean D10, so is a monoidal infinity categories, right? Uh, yes, this is a symmetric monoidal, yes. Infinity, okay. See and that. and there's, there's, there's also a question by Rana Zuri. Can you explain in what sense Tabwada's approach is cohomological and yours homological? Uh, I had a remark about this in the next. Uh, so the, wait, let me just write this. Yes, symmetric uh, monoidal infinity category. Yes. Then uh, the result. Um, well, the first thing it has to do with this 
up here. Okay, so it corrects, I correct the duality uh, in the beginning instead of correcting in the end. So cohomology theories are usually something that go from smooth schemes up to some abelian category. Okay, and in this case, we're not taking cohomology theory, we are taking an homology theory that goes to SH over S. So it has to do just with the variance or contravariance of the, of the theory. And of course, one is related to the other. And this is what I want to say uh, in the next slide, if I can skip it, is this piece of information here. It says that uh, the theory we're going to get, I'll come back to the next slide, the theory we're going to bet is actually dual in PRL uh, stable to Tabuada's construction. So meaning precisely that uh, SH of this talk is just functors to spectra from the water stock uh, to spectra. So it is exactly dual, okay? So the only reason why I'm mentioning this one is because we want to have a comparison that does not, uh, where the duality does not play a game. So I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. So, but first, let me go back to what I wanted to say. So this gives you a, so this, this uh, result gives you a, a characterization of this construction. So what we'll try to do is to define a theory of non-commutative motives that in a way is the universal thing that satisfies the analogs of these properties for DG categories. So what would this be? So the first thing is we define non-commutative spaces to be the digit categories of finite type. So finite type just means that they're obtained by fin attaching finitely many cells up to homotopy. Um, so I have to tell you what is an Isnevich square of digit categories of finite type. So um, I have to, I mean, I didn't say what was an Isnevich square of schemes. So in this case, I will just have to assume that you know what is an Isnevich square of schemes. So, but if you know, essentially, uh, I, I define this average square of digit categories to be pullback squares, such as this one, such that both these maps have the properties you would expect from an open immersion, meaning a localization. And the kernels uh, of these open immersions have to be uh, uh, isomorphic, which is exactly what to expect from the tal property from the Nisnevich square. So the, the interesting, the only thing you have to know from this Nisnevich square is, is that uh, Geometric Nisnevich squares through the functor perf, uh, so perf of a Nisnevich square is Nisnevich in this sense. So that's the only thing relevant for this story. Uh, yes? There, there's no condition on the functor from u prime to u then? There is a, it's a, it's a localization. It has to be a localization. Ah, all, all the maps in the square are localization. No, only, only, sorry, only these ones. Yeah, Which and what, 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 but what about the, the map from U prime to U then? There is no condition. Exactly like you have a, a Nisnevich square, down you have open immersions, and then the map is et al. But there is yeah. no condition. Yeah, so I, I'm not asking for any condition because it's going to be automatic because of this. Okay. So that's the trick. Uh, there, there are other questions. What are the cells uh, that you can attach in the category of DG categories? You start with DG categories that have only. Uh, so first of all, if you have if you have a simplex, you can take the free K module with those simplex. All right. If you start with the, just a simplexial complex, you start with the free K module generated by those simplexial complexes. This is going to give you DG categories that have. Uh, for instance, uh, one object zero, one object one, and this K module, and this uh, simplexes, and you start building from these ones. So it's essentially take the free DG categories generated by simplexes, and then you start attaching cells and, and building like that. Is it okay? Any more questions? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay, so. Essentially, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we will be taking these non-commutative spaces to be 
uh, sorry, this um, non commutative motives to be what you get from DG categories up by forcing uh, Nisnevich, by forcing A1 invariance, and by forcing Poincare duality, meaning you force, uh, sorry, you force, uh, you force this motive to be tensor invertible. So what you get is something. Uh, formal, but for the purpose of what we want to do, it's enough. So let me tell you what we want to do. So I just said that this construction is actually dual in the in this sense to so, the other so Yes. Yeah. Uh, what, what about the A one invariance property? As, how is it expressed? Uh, just uh, this. I have functors from from DG categories such that T tensor perf of A1 is perf of T. I, I, I force all functors to verify this property. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so why we did all this? So uh, the only reason we did all this is just to have this diagram. And now it's completely, uh, uh, how to say, um, setting is clear. We have uh, the motivic stable homotopy of schemes. We have whatever this formal construction is, uh, a stable motivic homotopy of non-commutative uh, spaces. We have a functor, this functor, which just comes from the universal property of this gadget. And by uh, a joint from the theorem, it has an, an adjoint, which is a symmetric lax monoidal. So all these are infinity functors, and these two, for free, uh, are a symmetric uh, lax monoidal. And yes. also, a last question: Does not the last condition come for free? What last condition? Mm. What uh, can you one? can you go upstairs? I I guess this this one. Yeah, it Maybe. comes um, almost for free. But you still have to invert uh, the circle. So this, this, in this Morel-Vavodsky theory, you have these two circles, right? The circle, the topological circle, and the algebraic circle. And in this case, what happens is that as soon as you invert uh, the topological circle, uh, the algebraic circle is invertible. And the reason for that is that this uh, category has a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition. Where this becomes just perf k plus perf k. So this is Balinson's description of the semi-orthogonal decomposition on perf of p1 that makes this trick. So yes, you don't have to tensor invert all of p1. It's enough to tensor invert the topological circle. So uh, let's continue. So the, the second thing I want to say it's this result. So this result was first uh, uh, was proved by Tabuada. I, I just kind of did the redid the computation in this setting, but this is uh, Tabuada's result. So the 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 result says that uh, actually, if I compute the homes in non-commutative spaces, uh, this is K theory maps to one. This is K theory. So this is Schlesing and Waldau's Schlesing's non-connective K theory. Yes, so there, there's uh, again a uh, precision asked by Mark Levin. Yes. So, but periodicity seems to be uh, built in. Board periodicity is built in. Uh, yes, it's built in. It's built in uh, from the fact, uh, well, it's built in because it's built in on already on K theory. Does this answer the question, Mark's question? Yeah. That's sort of backwards. I mean, <laughs> it's it's backwards. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, but it seems it seems it's in your description of P one. It already you killed the GM. So that you said uh, right because because of this semi-orthogonal decomposition. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. You're just making sure that that's that's what you were saying. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and there's again uh, uh, yet an, another question, but that's good. There are so many questions. So by an anonymous. Uh, attendees. So he says, when you are taking three DG categories and simplices in this construction, 
is this the construction for a simplex delta n take its image and the left adjoint to a coherent nerve c delta n and which is simp a simplicially enriched category then tensor the ohms with k and take the associated complex under adult can yes yes and then you have to do something else because you have to force moiety uh, invariance so there is an extra piece of that. This would only give them the cellular objects in the, in the theory of the G categories. But as I'm working in Morita theory, I have to make one step further. So someone has a problem to read. I have a weird symbol. I think it's DNC inside the, when you, in the theorem, Tabuada Robalo. Yes. Om, om sigma infinity of T. And inside it's DNC? No, it's a one. It's a unit. Ah, one. It's a tensor unit. Okay. It's one. Is it is the tensor non? Is a unit non commutative motif? Uh, there's another question. What is the additional thing to make it Morita invariant? It's already Morita invariant. Ah, in the in the in that construction. Uh, I, well, I have to invert modic equivalence, so I have to look at the categories of uh, modules. I uh, so I have to so okay. I have to take it important completion. Okay, that's his answer. I have to take all retracts of uh, all retracts of that important morphisms. Mm. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, again, another question. So, okay, what what are examples of e a one and c contractible objects in S H and C? That's a very good question. <laughs> I don't I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we can discuss about that later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, where was I? Ah, I was uh, about to tell you this result. Of um, that describes the home spaces as K theory. So a consequence of this is that now that we have this uh, this machine that goes from motives to this uh, gadget and comes back, actually what this result tells you is that if I take the unit, so this is one again. This is a one. This is one. If I take the unit non-commutative motive, and I send it through this adjoint M. What I get is a spectrum, is a motivic ring spectrum representing algebraic K theory. And actually, a nice thing of this machine is that for free, I get the, the commutative ring structure on this spectrum. It's a way to get it just by playing with the machines. And another nice thing is that this M, this construction, because of this result, that it sends 1 to KH, it lands inside modules over KH. So anything coming from whatever this is, lands inside uh, KH modules. So, uh, so let's go to motives of DG categories. Uh, so the, here's the construction we're gonna do. The construction we're gonna do is the following. Uh, start with the DG category, uh, which you see as a non commutative space, some, some definition, you send it, to SH, and then you take a uh, this ohm to one, and then you send it again through this uh, M to SH. So in the end, all this construction, what is it doing? Let's pick a notation. I'm sending T to what I call through this process, this um, uh, a parenthesis uh, T. So what is this explicitly? So let's look explicitly what is this doing. So if I take any smooth scheme, in SH, so maps from the smooth scheme to whatever this is, is by a junction, is maps from perf to this ohm, and this is just these maps. But I just told you that maps to the unit is K theory. So this construction is sending a DG category T to a, an object in SH, which you can think of as a press sheave of spectra, an object in SH that does the following. It takes a scheme and it spits out the K theory of T tensor by perfect complex on that scheme. It's a construction. 
And uh, this is what we're gonna call the motivic uh, realization of a DG category for, for the purpose of, of this talk. So let's just check some of the properties of this. So the first example is that if you take a smooth scheme over a base S, and if you construct this, look at what is this uh, motivic realization of the, perfect, of the category of perfect compasses on X, what you get is just the following object. So X lives over S. You have the six operations. So this is uh, due to the work of uh, Sisinski, De Glees, and uh, Jose Fayou. So you can push forward uh, this object KH that represents algebraic K theory here. So they push it forward, and the result is that these two things coincide. So in a way, this is computing K theory of X, of X uh, the, the global sections of K theory of X. So I will not well explain you the, the, how this computation go. Instead, I, I will go to uh, this singularity category story. So here's the setting of what we want to do. I want to start with a, a scheme over X with a function. I want to look at the zero locus of that function. And I want to look at the singularity category of that zero locus. So we will define this motive of the singularity category to be uh, this, um, uh, this construction I just described. So in a way, it gives me KTD of whatever I eat, whatever smooth scheme I plug in, tensor this category. So this lands inside KH modules, and it gives me a definition. And this definition will be interested until the end of this talk. Uh, it seems a complicated definition, but we can actually get some computations done. So let's look at the, so it's just a, a first re remark. I will tell you uh, some properties of this construction. So the first thing is that if I take, uh, so this construction of MF that sends a pair to uh, MF of that pair uh, is actually Lacus monoidal. So meaning it sends if I have two pairs and I tense and I uh, uh, multiply them and with the functions being the addition of the two functions, it goes to the tensor product. So this is the, the Tom Sebastiani theorem I just mentioned. Let me write. Okay. And so in particular, the unit, so the point with the zero function goes to the unit, which is two periodic complexes. And because this is Lux monoidal, it tells me that for any pair, the motive of this pair is a module over this category. So there is an action of this, meaning two periodic complexes on, uh, on this motive. And this just comes by, again for free because of the way we build this machine. And um, so in fact, uh, so well, this is the action. This is what I meant by the first uh, piece of the, the slide. So this thing of X zero is actually uh, a two periodic KH module because of this action. So can we compute, so this is how we, we get the, the computation. So can we compute this object? So I will fix the following setting. So the setting is I have X living over a base scheme S with some map P. I will suppose that uh, the generic fiber, so I will assume S is of the following kind. Either it's uh, something of this kind, power series in T, or power series in T with coefficients in FP or ZP, or even more generally some excellent trait. So in that case, with this hypothesis, but you can think of one of these three examples, I'm gonna consider the following setting. I have my X, I have my base scheme, my disk, it's like one of these is a formal disk. I have my punctured disk and I have my center of the disk. And then I'm gonna consider the function given by my projection and the uniformizer. So the uniformizer is just a choice of T or P here. And I have this uh, set ring. And in this setting, um, I can make a several, a bunch of constructions. They might seem a bit disconnected for now, but you will see how this comes into place. So the first construction I'm gonna build out of this setting is the cohomology of the punctured disk. 
so maybe I should just write this way. So what do I mean by cohomology of the puncture disk? Well, I'm just gonna compute this object in SH, maybe I should write it, in SH over sigma. So meaning I take the unit object in motives over eta, I push it forward, I push it back. And I get something I call motivic cohomology of the puncture disk. So the first observation is that this is a commutative algebra object. Uh, and the second observation is that I can give an explicit formula for this uh, cohomology of this puncture disk. So it's not, it's not very different from what you would expect in topology from the cohomology of the disk. You just have a generator in degree zero and you have a generator in degree one, but shifted. It happens that here the shift has to be with a tape twist. So there is this extra piece of information, but essentially this is, this is a circle. So I'm gonna call theta this generator that lives in this, in this state degree. And I'm gonna use this uh, algebra to say something about uh, what I want to find is this category of thing x zero. So how does this go? The first observation is that this cohomology of the puncture disk acts on the cohomology of the fiber, of the smooth fiber. So this guy acts in the cohomology of this guy by pullback. So there's a multiplication by theta. Another thing is that the cohomology of uh, this fiber acts under specialization, specialization on the cohomology of this fiber. So there is a map of algebras uh, from one to the other by specialization. So I'm sorry if I cannot explain what this, uh, all what this means, but the upshot is that in the end, I can combine the action of the circle with the action with this specialization to produce a map of algebras like this. But if you want, just keep in mind that there is an action of the puncture disk on the action or on the cohomology of the generic fiber. And then what, what we can also do is to repeat exactly the same thing, but uh, we work in the level of KU modules. So we replace the unit, as somewhere I put the unit, by the KU module, uh, the unit KU module. So the same thing happens, uh, the same thing holds. I have again an action of the puncture disk on this KH version of the cohomology. So I can now tell you the main, uh, uh, somehow the main technical uh, result of this talk. It's this one, is an explicit computation of the motive of MF uh, as the homotopy fiber of this action. So, um, this might seem a bit uh, dry just to look at this, this this way. And this is why I want to just briefly mention the main ingredient that goes into this proof. I think the main ingredient already gives some, can give some intuition. So the, the main ingredient, the main idea of proving these two things are equivalent is actually to show that two certain algebras are equivalent. So what are these two algebras? On one side, we have the gadget I just introduced homology of the puncture disk. On the other side, we have this thing of S0. So this is a category, but because this is a unit of the entire two periodic categories, actually it is a symmetric monodal category. So in particular, when I take the motive, I get a commutative algebra object. So the first claim is that the, the cohomology of the, of the disk, of the puncture disk, of the circle, and this motif of seeing as zero are the same algebras. So this is an iso of algebras. So this is the, the main, uh, the main uh, piece of ingredient that allows us to prove uh, this formula I described before. And once you have this, once you have this theorem, uh, this one follows just by playing with exact sequences. So I will not uh, mention what this is. You can check the notes after, um, but that's the, that's the main idea. And so using this result, um, we can uh, compute this, uh, sorry, compute this motif of MF. And for the time left I have, I'm sorry, how much time I have left? Uh, wow. I have five minutes. Yeah. Or, okay. Uh, you can take slightly more. So I will try 
to explain you very quickly what is the relation with vanishing cycles to this story. So I just told you uh, how to define the motive of a DG category. Uh, if you don't want to, if you, you, you can forget all the all the the details, the technical details. Just think it's an object in SH. It's a BU mo it's a KH module in SH. And now I have to explain you how the from the side the vanishing cycle side of the story, I can also produce a KH module in SH. So uh, very briefly, I will not have time to go into this as I expected, but the story of vanishing cycles uh, essentially tries to study uh, the following. If you have a family of uh, algebraic varieties parameterized by uh, over the line, then you can try to understand the complex line, then you can try to understand how some cycles uh, they generate once t goes to zero. So this is just a, a heuristic picture of, of what can be going on. You can have cycles like this, that collapses at, as, as, as the fiber moves to zero. And you also have the monodromy action uh, on these vanishing cycles. So uh, I hope, I, I thought I would have, I would go have some more time at, at this time. Uh, so I'll just skip this part and just tell you directly the straight to the point. The point is that if I look at X zero, my uh, fiber, uh, I can construct a sheaf called the sheaf of nearby cycles and another sheaf called the sheaf of vanishing cycles that captures exactly these kind of cycles that like this uh, that disappear when I go to a fiber with critical points. So the main theorem is that uh, I can do the following construction. So let's look at my central fiber and let's take for each point on my central fiber like this one, let's take a ball in CN and let's take a, a nearby fiber. So it's a fiber very close uh, to, to, to the fiber at zero. And let's intersect this fiber uh, with the ball. So I want to say something like this. So if I take a fiber a T small enough, I can take this uh, thing called the Milner fiber. And, and as the point varies along my central fiber, I'm going to have either nothing, the uh, trivial, uh, uh, trivial cohomology, or I'm going to have something like this as I move to the critical point. So essentially, if I just start taking the cohomologies of these fibers, of these small intersections, as x varies, this forms a sheaf. This forms a sheaf on the central fiber. And this is called the sheaf of nearby cycles. This is a theorem you can find, it's Milner, you can find this in SGA7. And you can also take the reduced cohomology. And this is be kind of called the sheaf of uh, vanishing cycles. So for the purpose of this talk, what is important is that you have an exact sequence where you have the cohomology of the central fiber, the nearby cycles, and the quotient is exactly the vanishing cycles. So this is the, the upshot. So let's go back to the motivic side of the story. So in this talk, we're going to have um, not uh, uh, up there. I, I, I gave you the uh, the ram, sorry, um, a Betty side of the story, but we're going to use here the Aladic side. So we have uh, vanishing cycles, uh, the sheaf of nearby cycles, and this also has motivic versions. This is due to IU. And in fact, what happens? Uh, well, let's focus on the Aladic side of the story. You have this uh, exact sequence I mentioned before, where you have Eladic, uh, sorry, uh, the, the cohomology of the central fiber, vanishing cycles, sorry, nearby cycles, and vanishing cycles. And all these come with an action of the Galois group. So the Galois group in this case is the Galois group of, of the puncture disk. And in particular, for, to make the theorem true, the theorem I want to give, we're going to have to look at a particular subgroup of the Galois group. And it's called the inertia subgroup. I want to write it. Inertia subgroup. So we're going to be looking at inertia subgroup. We want to be taking the homotopy fixed points for this inertia subgroup. 
And uh, the way the previous part of the story comes in is this theorem of Deligne. That says the following thing. If I look at the homotopy invariance of this, uh, of this, uh, of QL sigma, what you get is the cohomology of the punctured disk. This is just a very refined way of, of saying something like in topology you are perfectly used to, which is the following result. Think of the perf the, of the of the punctured disk as a circle, S1, and think of the the choice of a, of an algebraic closure of, of the punctured disk as the choice of the universal cover of S1, meaning just a point. And think of sigma as C. And in this case, uh, this side of the story is just telling that you can take fixed points for inertia, but inertia is just automorphisms of the of universal cover and taking fixed points or derived fixed points is just taking a multiple fixed points for the constant action, the trivial action on C. On the other side, this is the cohomology of the disk, which is this. So this theorem, if you look at what he's saying on the topological analogy, is just saying that the cohomology of the disk is just homotopy fixed points is of homotopy fixed points um, for the trivial z action on C. Uh, so this is how this uh, this um, this is how to interpret this, interpret this result. So another piece of ingredients we're going to need for this story. First one is this Eladic realization functor. So everything we built so far works in motives. We're going to take the Eladic realization. And then there is this theorem of Ayub saying that the construction of vanishing cycles, uh, well, first there is a motivic version and second, it coincides, they coincide under this realization. So with all this in place, I can tell you finally the comparison theorem. So the comparison theorem works like this. Let's start with the DG category. Through all the things I said before, I can land, I can produce this. This, this is a functor I called this. From all the things we said before, I can produce an object in SH, which actually lands inside KH modules. And now I'm gonna take the realization. And the realization lands inside the realization of KH. And there is a, a result of uh, Joel Ryu that uses both periodicity and a gamma filtration to compute this realization. And it just says that the realization of KH is just the two periodized Eladic homologies. Essentially, it's the copies of Eladic homology uh, uh, in all degrees, uh, even degrees, with a shift by date degree, date tw twist by n. So another way to say it's just a free algebra on the Tate object. So now that we have all these, I can tell you the, the main theorem. And the main theorem is this. The main theorem says, uh, so let me go slowly here. The main theorem says the following. It says that we started with this category of singularities. We define this gadget called the motivic realization. So it lives in SH. And now we took its Eladic realization. So now this is an Eladic sheaf over, uh, S, uh, over X0, actually. So I can take global, oh, sorry, I should take global sections. I should put this to make this work. So on the other side, what do we have? Well, we have the vanishing cycles sheaf. I take a multiple fixed points. I take the cohomology, but then I have to two periodize. And the theorem say that these two things are the same. So again, I will not give you the proof, but I will give you the, the main isomorphism that makes this work. So let me go like this. So as I said before, the main thing that made the first comparison that made possible the computation of the motive of singularities was the fact that sing of S0 gave us the cohomology of the punctured disk. So this we saw in the previous slide. And now I also saw in the previous slide the 
the algebraic version of the circle uh, result, that is the cohomology of the circle, is actually the cohomology, uh, the, the invariance with respect to the Z action on, on C. So the combination of these two isomorphisms is what allows us to show uh, this equivalence. So everything follows from this, plus some uh, gymnastics with, uh, with the exact sequence. The exact sequence that defines singularity category and the exact sequence that defines vanishing cycles. So I'm sorry if I had to go too fast here. I think I went really too fast. Please tell me if you have questions or if you want me to go back. I had a survey of recent results ready, but uh, I think I already went my time. So I apologize. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we'll see that for a question. So first, first of all, thanks, thanks for the talk, Mark, Marco. And uh, so we'll, we'll go now to the questions, if there are. So I have a question. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the, the toen Vezzosi approach to the block, to the block condu conductor formula. Yes, so this okay, is what's Can you say a little bit? Yes, yeah. so this is one of the things I had in the survey. So yeah, yeah, so. So the, the, the approach, uh, the, so I'm very briefly, very sketchily, uh, the idea is the following. So if you are over C, let's take a family over C, and you have the central fiber and the smooth fiber. Then you can compute this delink number. Uh, so this delink number, if I, by, by definition, the dimension of the uh, of vanishing cycles, of the piece of commodity of vanishing cycles, and you can compute it as the difference of Euler characteristics between the Euler characteristics of the the smooth fiber and the Euler characteristics of the central fiber. So, but because of uh, this difference of Euler characteristics, if you think the way, you, how you define vanishing cycles, you define it by means of this exact sequence. So you have the cohomology of the central fiber, nearby, nearby fiber, and the excess is the vanishing cycles. So Euler characteristic uh, sends exact sequences to sums. So in particular, the difference between these two has to be the Euler characteristic of vanishing cycles. So this link number is actually the Euler characteristic of the sheep of vanishing cycles. So this is the starting point of the story. So this works over C. So the over C, this is known. So now you want to go to other disks like ZP. And in this case, uh, you have to correct the formula. So this is block conjecture. You have to, the formula is true, but there is a correction to be added which comes from the representation theory. And this is called, the, this extra term is called the Swan conduct, okay? So the, the approach that uh, uh, Toen and Vizozzi are trying to develop, um, and they already have results uh, for, for the block conjecture, is first of all, using the observation that uh, the Euler characteristic of vanishing cycles uh, is the same as the Euler characteristic with inertia invariance. This is because it's a symmetric monodal functor. And, and because of the theorem that I just mentioned, the Euler characteristic of these and the Euler characteristic of MF have to, to coincide. So the whole idea of the program is to compute explicitly the Euler characteristic of this MF. So by MF here, I mean the motive. And to show that you get for free the left-hand side of the, sorry, the left-hand side of the block uh, conductor formula. So the, the new tool here, if you want, is the fact that you can compute this approach, this number uh, through MF. So this is a theorem already when I is acting unipotently. So the, this is essentially the, their, their, their program and the way they're tackling it. I don't know if this answers your question. Hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah, good. So there are other questions. So I read the first one by Tom Bachman. Are there higher chromatic analogs of a relation between KH mod and SHNC? SH non commutative. So the answer is uh, yes, I expect them to be, to exist. Uh, I expect, uh, so it, it's yes, so, so people. So how do we put this? There are versions of non-commutative motives um, where uh, essentially you can replace uh, 
DG categories by other forms of DG categories or either N DG categories or symmetric EL monodal DG categories. And essentially you can build versions of non-commutative motives on this. And as it go higher on the, the N, you are a priori should go higher in the chromatic tower also. Uh, but this is something I, I mean, this is a work in progress, let's say, with the Gabriele Vizzozzi, Mauro Porta. Uh, it's been in progress for quite a long time. Uh, we discussed this last year also with Eldon Elmanto. So now we kind of got somehow locked in this, but the idea is that there should be, yes, there should be. So if you have more, we can discuss this uh, after this talk if you have more questions. Uh, I can, it'd be nice to talk about this. All right, so there's another question by by Mark Levin. Is the, so it's in the main theorem, is the new power HL in the main theorem an etal shift or an object in SH of the central fiber? Which one? So it's ex exactly this, this thing you have shown here, this new upper this one? HI, the right-hand side. This. Where is that living? The thing inside, before you take the H star, QL, where's, where's that thing living on the inside? That thing, yeah. New HI minus it's one. It lives on the stage of the central fiber. Ah, okay. So then, then the question is, do you get, do you have an isomorphism somewhere, maybe after making the right-hand side into a KH module before taking a tau realization? Uh, before taking a tau realization, so let me, so you can make this new HI. That, this new HI, you're, this is just Ayub's. Uh, this is Ayub's, yes. Yeah. So, so you yes, can make I, Yes. So I think, yes, I think this is possible. I just have to be careful about this inertia invariance in the, in the Ayub setting, but I think this is true. If it, I think this is true. Oh, yeah. Okay. They Thanks. can prove the theorem directly in motives. Right. Right. Great. Thanks. Okay. Oh. Okay, and there is a last question. So someone wants to know, uh, um, someone wants to hear you say something about recent results. Oh, uh, so, the block. yes, so I mentioned the blog and someone asked the, the question about what happens when you have uh, uh, multiple functions. So I just want to briefly mention this, uh, the thesis results of uh, Massimo Pipi. You can find an archive. Um, so the idea is that it extended part of the results I just mentioned, but to the case where you have uh, multiple functions and you intersect all their zeros. So starting from some ambient scheme X with uh, several functions, he produced in his thesis a new definition of matrix factorizations and singularity categories uh, in this context. Uh, he also extended the results of uh, Orlov and uh, about his equivalence between singularity categories and matrix factorizations. And finally, he also computes explicitly this motive of MF, with multiple functions, using this result uh, of um, or Orlov and Burke and uh, Walker that allows you to, if you have a scheme with multiple functions, this result allows you to pack all the multiple functions in a single, uh, not a function, a single section of a line bundle in some projective space. So essentially, it allows you to reduce the problem of multiple functions to a problem of one function. And using this, uh, it also gives a description, explicit description of this motive of matrix factorizations with many, many functions. So yes, so this is, I mean, I, I will not give you the details, but you can look at his thesis on archive. He posted the thesis on archive and it's, um, it's very easy to, it's very well written. You can, you can see the, you can follow it. So there's a comp complementary question. Does the sequence have to be regular or can I just take the derived vanishing locus? I think it doesn't have to be regular. You can take the derived, so you can take the derived version, yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I'm sorry if I went too fast at some point. So in any case, I'm mm -hmm. gonna post, I give you the, the slides. Ah, good. Thanks. So we'll put that on the YouTube page of your talk. Also. Okay, so no more questions.
Yeah, so let, let's thanks again. So thank you, Marco, for the nice talk and, uh, and thank you for the for organizing the summer school in these conditions. I can imagine oh, the, the it works. Trouble. Yes. <laughs> okay, and so we we meet tomorrow for at uh, at one p.m. for the the next day. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.